Hello and welcome back to The Daily Climate Show on Sky News. Now, we're getting straight to some of those climate issues now with climate activist Laura Young and Navrav Singhali, lecturer in climate law. So, very good evening to both of you. Nice to see you both. So, it feels like only yesterday that we were all in Glasgow, bringing you hour-by-hour hour updates on negotiations on the Glasgow Climate Pact, but it's actually six months on, and it's fair to say the world's focus has shifted. Well, Alok Sharma and Nicola Sturgeon today both called for renewed attention on climate action. And, Laura, how badly do you think that's needed? What's happened since COP26? Has the world's attention, do you think, shifted away from climate issues? I think it has. And I think one of the problems is we have shifted our thoughts to many other issues, but forgotten that many of them relate to climate change or will be exacerbated by climate change or impact climate change. So we really need to get our heads screwed on a little bit more and think about it. And I think your question at the beginning is right. What has happened over the last six months? It feels like a lot of backtracking has happened. It feels like there is a lot of hypocrisy and it feels like there's a lot of disagreement. Everyone seemed to be all on the same page when COP26 was in Glasgow, but now it seems like people have gone back to their old ways or are now fighting a different cause and trying to take us in a different direction than we need to be going in. But Navraj, the world is a different place, isn't it? The uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has shifted the dial completely and some countries might be making some short-term decisions to address this issue of weaning themselves off Russian oil and gas, which may not be good for the environment, but it's completely understandable, also given the, the cost of living crisis too. Sure. Um... Well, in one way, I think the world is not a different place. We live in a world of uh, permanent crises, whether it's um, uh, large scale uh, military interventions or uh, global pandemics or before that global financial crises and so on and so forth. So you cannot defer climate action for a nice stable point in time when it becomes easy because it's never going to be easy. Um, so that's uh, merely wishful thinking. Um, and this, the second point is that if you make policy or strategies to uh, respond to uh, the uh, Ukraine intervention um, and climate change right now, by the time these policies are put into pr practice, the crisis that you were trying to deal with or that, you were, that was hanging over your head, Ukraine, will be long gone. Putin will be out of power. There'll be a new structure in Ukraine. And, uh, but we will have uh, embedded a whole bunch of high carbon activities which will be with us for decades. So that's not the way to make policy. And yet the government would say, Laura, they're still on track to meet what are very ambitious targets, they say. And part of their plans in, in response to the Ukraine crisis are to talk about increasing the amount of wind power, the amount of hydrogen, the amount of nuclear and the amount of solar. But I think there's also a big push from people within the government to not just be going for that, but also be going for new oil and gas exploration. Kwasi Kwarteng is a prime example of someone who is really supportive of new exploration, using that as an excuse um, to be producing more of that domestically. And there's a bit of irony there because, of course, he took on the role that Alok Sharma left to become full-time COP26 president. And now he is taking up that role and pushing for more oil oil and gas exploration, which is not within reaching 1.5 or limiting 1.5. We know that the International Energy Agency said we need to be moving away from that. And it's really frustrating to see that disagreement, hypocrisy, those challenges that we are facing from different members of senior government disagreeing with one another and pushing for their own agendas. Well, yeah, and that those that back it say that it still can happen and, and the government reach its targets, don't they? Um, and Navraj, what about COP27? It's uh, coming up in November. There's more pressure this time round for countries to, to come forward with, with plans to meet targets. Does that give you source of optimism looking ahead? I think one thing that um, shouldn't be understated is this nature of the success that COP26 was, um, very significant um, change in the attitude of the international community was achieved and some very important uh, milestones, some of which you mentioned. So that's very positive. The key point in uh, the trajectory of COPs is maintaining the momentum from pres COP presidency, currently the United Kingdom, to COP presidency, Egypt next. Um, and that handover is absolutely critical to implementation. 
So we know that there's a, a lot of um, very detailed work that's going on to implement uh, the uh, Paris, uh, the uh, Glasgow commitments, different of the uh, Glasgow commitments, and that's ongoing. It's absolutely essential, though, that the handover is strong and supportive and that the UK, which I'm sure it will, uh, continues to uh, support its Egyptian colleagues in that. OK, let's move on to our, our next topic, shall we? Because uh, the big plastic count is underway, but will it do any good? The message doesn't seem to necessarily have got through. And, and Navraj, uh, we were saying earlier that the UK is second only to the US in terms of our levels of plastic pollution. Why do you think that is? Why do we have this bad record in this country? It's, it's quite shocking, isn't it? Um, it's... I think part of the reason why we're finding it very difficult to wean ourselves off plastic is the very close relationship between the petrochemicals uh, sector and government. So um, we saw over the weekend, for example, in a slightly different but similar context over um, food and obesity, that the government at the slightest push from industry resiles from commitments that it had made about um uh, you know, changing the way that um, uh, food is advertised and high, um, fatty food is advertised. We're seeing, um, you know, enormous pushback from the uh, sector, both the uh, business as usual um, agro sector and the petrochemicals industry, which provides the packaging, to any change at all. Um, and you know, the relationship between government and those sectors is so intimate that this particular government um, is unwilling to take any particular, um, any sort of decisive action on the issue. So there's a real political lock-in problem here. Whatever you think of, of that relationship, Laura, is this really about supermarkets making sure that they demand that their suppliers use less plastic and then it makes it easier for consumers to avoid it too? They have to, because why are we the second biggest consumer or you know, polluter of plastic because we have to buy it because that's all we are provided with. When you walk into a supermarket, if you want something that's plastic free, good luck trying to find it. So we need supermarkets and businesses as well to be pushing for it. We saw Boots, the retailer, the kind of pharmacy retailer, say that they are going to stop selling wet wipes with plastic in it. They are the biggest seller of wet wipes with plastic in it in the UK. They represent about 15% of sales. So that is a business that just recently has decided to push for that change. And we need to see more of that because I agree that the government are too slow, but we do need policy change. But we also need brands and you know corporations to step up and help us out because as consumers, we are really restricted with what we can buy. And you know I'm going to be taking part in the count and I think it's going to be a big wake up for me and many other people. But that's also going to sit with a lot of guilt and a lot of guilt, which I don't really know where to place because often you try your hardest, but you are really limited with what you can buy. Never do you think that's right, or can consumers do more themselves? Very briefly, if you can. I don't think that it's fair to dump the responsibility of these sorts of issues on consumers. I think that there are mechanisms that we're familiar with in, say, electronic waste, where you put place an obligation on the uh, entity that produces that waste to take it back and to uh, recycle or reuse, or indeed not to produce it in the first place. Um, those sorts of producer obligations, I think, are a far more uh, reliable okay. and equitable solution to the plastic problem rather than um, requiring consumers to take the initiative when, okay. as was just said, consumers have very few choices in this matter. OK, we must leave it there. Navraj and Laura, always good to get your thoughts. Thanks very much indeed for joining us tonight. Thank you. And that's it from me. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.